on this episode of Postcards. I don't know why I survived and my siblings and my parents did not. I think one of the benefits is that really the world is your oyster when you're, you know, a rural artist. Through ethnobotany, I've also been put on this path of really valuing the knowledge of my ancestors, which helped me to value myself. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at ExploreAlex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at LRAC4Calendar.org. I want to show you my number. This A is for Auschwitz. It was done in Auschwitz. And it was the people who were like us there who had to do that. The Nazis stood with their guns next to them, so naturally they had to do that. But I don't know the number. I, don't, I never look at it. I was born in Hungary, and I had two sisters, and a father and mother, and many relatives. My city was called Maros Vasarhely, which is impossible to, to write down. We were in our home until 1944, when the Germans came into Hungary. We were taken into a trains with the railroad cars. We were put into those, and we were taken to Auschwitz. When we got out, we saw this uh, smoke and then we could smell some very strange things and we were lined up, a man on one side and women on the other side, in rows of five. And then a doctor whose name was Mengele, I found out later, stood in front of the, and we had to proceed ahead and he was pointing with his stick. Those who had to go left and those who had to go right. They killed those that went left with gas. And then they burned them in the crematorium. And that is what we could smell when we came. I was 15 at the time. My older sister was 18. And uh, my mother, we went on the right side, so we were okay, but my younger sister was only 12. And my mother, who spoke German, said, this is my child and I want her to come with us, so they let her do that. Then one day they decided that my older sister and I should go into another camp. My, uh, Mother and younger sister were, I didn't see them anymore. My old 
older sister and I. We worked at the railroad tracks. We put down all kinds of uh, things, and uh, we had to dig holes and things, and the, the, it was frozen. So it was a terrible situation. We were there for some time until the Russians were close by and they had to take us away from there. So they took us into a camp in Germany called Bergen-Belsen. That was actually just hell. It was filthy and dirty. We didn't work anymore. There was disease. There were lice. There were all kinds of things like that. And we, it got to the point where uh, my sister and I just couldn't even walk anymore. And she got sick with typhus, and she passed away right next to me. When my sister died, I just probably gave up because I didn't remember anything after that. I don't know how I came out, but I found myself in a clean bed with 12, 12 beds in a beautiful room. Several of these people who survived, like myself, were taken to Sweden. That's where I met my husband. And uh, he too was a Holocaust survivor. And he introduced himself we talked, and my friend and I, we made remarks in Hungarian, thinking he didn't know Hungarian. <laughs> it turned out that he did. <laughs> but that was a highlight of my hospital stay, <laughs> because we became friends, and uh, then we got married, and we were married 65 years. And when we had our family, we became very happy about that, you know. We became sort of a normal family. Someone asked me whether I hate, hate the people. And I don't think I ever had hatred in my heart. But then after the war, I read Jewish writings. It says that you should love thy neighbors and your enemies. But I could not love my enemies, but I, I tried not to hate them. I don't know why I survived, and my siblings and my parents did not. There were over six million Jews who were put to death during this time. During the Second World War, there were a few survivors, but now, of course, a lot of us are getting fewer and fewer. My husband spoke quite often to schools about his experiences, and I never could because I had the feeling that if I start speaking and you feel sorry for me, I will start to cry. But since he passed away, I felt that maybe I shouldn't be crying, and I became strong.
about two years ago, Judy Barron called me because Judy's a local artist and a survivor of the Holocaust. Judy's from Hungary originally, and she is a watercolorist and artist, and she painted pictures from a book called Children of a Vanished World. So Judy calls me and says, I have these paintings, and what should I do with them? So I said, I told them about the Fagan Museum in Granite Falls, and I said, why don't I talk to Ron and Diane? And maybe they'll find a way to exhibit the pictures. Now when the Fagans embark on any project, they complete it to the nth degree, both details large and small, as you can see when you go to the museum. You have the paintings all beautifully framed, you have the voiceover, you have the background about her life, and you have the people in the earphones, and they can go and listen and learn about Judy's art and her story against the backdrop of the larger story that they tell about the Holocaust. I have always liked painting, even as a child. I, I had lots of paintings that I left, and I'm sure they got lost somehow, because everything else did get lost. Even in Sweden, I could not afford to get any uh, paints or things like that, but I used watercolors, and I was painting a little bit. Then when I came to the United States, I started going to classes, so I painted in oils and in acrylics and in watercolors. There was a man named Roman Wisniak who knew that things were going badly and sort of snuck into Romania and Poland and Hungary in little villages where Jews lived. He took pictures and then when he came out he printed these pictures and stories in books in black and white. And I had some of his books and I looked at this one with the children. And because I was a child myself, I just got so involved with trying to paint them. And I got to 18 of those. And in Hebrew, 18 means high, and that means life. So I was thinking maybe some of them survived like myself. First of all, there weren't a lot of survivors of the Holocaust. An even smaller subset of people and less numbers of survivors of the Holocaust were artists, right? An even smaller subset of people are survivors of the Holocaust who were artists who later in life decided it was part of their life's journey to paint or to, in a way, recreate their experience. And so she did, using these Roman Vishniak photographs as her backdrop. There's a whole artistic form and conversion of photography to painting. And probably much of her emotion and much of the way she views her life is expressed in that transformation. There aren't many chances for people from Granite Falls or most places to meet a survivor of the Holocaust. And maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Maybe in that moment, or maybe in that hour, or maybe in that two hours, it's a life-forming or a life-changing experience. Again, we go back to thanking the Fagans and all those responsible for creating such moments. Those are classic educational moments, teaching moments. That's what they are. It's a wonderful opportunity. It is so important for children to learn history and to see the good things that happen and the bad things like the Holocaust. And then 
try to live the life of the good side and be kind to people and respect each other. Digital and watercolor artist is an artist that does watercolor and then takes those images and then enhances them digitally once, once they're complete. My art is kind of a culmination of a few things. I start by doing some sketches of ideas that just kind of pop into my head, things I think that would look neat once they're put together. And then I'll take those sketches, paint them out in some watercolor, and then after that I digitize them. So put them in the computer and alter the way they look, manipulate the images, add some things together until I have a piece that I think is complete. I own a flower shop in Wheaton, Minnesota, and I am the floral designer there, as well as kind of taking care of all of the business aspects, uh, which isn't like something I super enjoy. I like to be creative, so doing those things is a lot more fun to me, uh, but I really do uh, enjoy the floral design part. One of the things I like the most about it is having the store. I can go to market, buy all the products uh, that I see in my store here, and that's what really inspired me to become uh, a digital and watercolor artist is seeing those products in the store and thinking, you know what, I, I can do that. It would be so much fun to see my artwork on uh, wrapping paper or a canvas painting that's you know hanging in someone's house. I love to do window displays uh, here in the store. That kind of comes from my previous uh, experience as a graphic designer. I worked for a clothing company at their corporate office and I did a lot of window displays. That's definitely one of the perks for me is getting to do those because they're fun. Uh, uh, you know, nobody else is telling me what to do so it's definitely something I can just be creative and come up with on my own. I always have ideas happening in my head. I'll be inspired by like a cool old door that I see or I'll be driving down the road and see a cute little raccoon and I'm like, oh, that would make such a cute little piece of art. So I'll, I'll take those ideas, I kind of bring them back home and then I'll kind of turn that into my own version. Uh, I'll sketch it out and then after I have the sketch complete, I will add in the watercolor uh, paint. And then after the paint is done, I scan it in put it into the computer. I use Photoshop mostly to create the pieces after that. A lot of times it's combining a few paintings. For the raccoon, I put some birch trees in the background and I added a little bow tie. So all of those things go in after the fact on the computer. I love animals and I love flowers. <laughs> so a lot of my, my flower uh, inspiration, you know, does come from, from having my work as a florist. I'm inspired by that all the time. As you can imagine, my world is kind of immersed in flowers. And I also just really love animals. We have lots of dogs and cats, and I just think that they're fun, uh, they're cute, and they're also a really big trend right now. So uh, kind of trying to stay on trend and kind of come up with what, you know, what might be the next, the it animal, I guess. My favorite pieces, a lot of them are the more modern pieces. That's just my personal taste. I like the very clean and simple pieces. The, the hexagon series that I did in the blue, those are, those are one of my favorites. One of the benefits is that really the world is your oyster when you're, you know, a rural artist. You can, because of the internet, you know, you can do your artwork anywhere. Uh, and for me personally, being inspired by nature uh, and and 
you know, having all of those animals and having those things close. I, you know, I can drive out in the country five miles and, you know, I, I can see those things for myself. So having those as a reference point is great. You know, you can really do your artwork anywhere. So having the internet, you know, definitely has opened up a lot of, um, a lot of things for me as an artist. Being an artist has has really kind of taken me on a self-discovery journey. Uh, you know, I uh, had children young, so um, my whole life has kind of been about my kids and um, raising them, so I never really got to discover who I was. And now that my kids are getting older and involved in more activities that, you know, they're out of the house and I have more time for myself. I really, you know, was able to discover that I really enjoy painting. I really enjoy creating things. Um, for me, it's very peaceful and it's a very good stress reliever. So I love to be able to find that time uh, for myself and kind of do something that hopefully I can share with everyone. A lot of people ask me, how did I start doing this? How did I get to be an ethnobotanist? And really, um, I come from a long line of people who use plants for food and medicine. And I would go on walks with my grandmother and she would show me all the plants that we would see out on the land. It was amazing because as I was looking at these plants and learning these plants from her, uh, she, she would know everything. She'd be able to tell me their names. She'd be able to tell me about how those plants interact with the animals around them. So like this plant is eaten by deer, but this plant, uh, the seeds are eaten by mice. You know, She knew all of that. She knew the exact habitat in which I could find these plants and which plants grew together. As I was growing up and I eventually went to college, I realized that my grandmother was a scientist. You know, she was a native scientist. She had an intimate relationship and knowledge of the land around her that came from observation and experimentation and this long-term knowledge that had been passed down from her family. And, uh, you know, I often think about that, think about my grandmother as a scientist and, you know, how different would I have been as a native person? How different would I have been as a young person if I had known that I was descended from scientists? You know, because they never tell us that. They never tell us that our knowledge is still valid and useful in today's world. And it certainly is. Um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of contemporary pharmaceuticals come from ethnobotanical knowledge. It comes from the knowledge of indigenous people all over the world. And so that's what I try to talk to my students about and um, that's how I got my start. That's what I say, they're like that family member, you know, who you don't like very much, but anytime you really need something, <laughs> they're always there to help you. That's the dandelion, they're always there for you. So today I'm at the Lower Sioux Reservation and we are making four traditional uh, and contemporary uh, uh, preparations using traditional plants uh, and other traditional ingredients. The first thing that we made today is a lip balm and this is one of my favorite lip balms because it just contains three basic ingredients. It's oil, whatever oils you have laying around. Uh, in this case, we're using organic olive oil and organic coconut oil. But if you only have some you know, uh, regular olive oil sitting around or even some vegetable oil, you can absolutely use those. Or if you only want to use coconut oil or olive oil, you can do that as well. Uh, so it's, it's oils. It's nettles, stinging nettles, dried and added to the oil in a crock pot for as long as you can. And then we'll strain it and we'll just add some melted beeswax until we get the consistency that we like for lip balm.
The other preparation that we made is we made these beautiful face masks. It's just something to pamper yourself with. They're great to get glowing, moisturized skin, but they're also fantastic for things like poison ivy or you know, perhaps an infected uh, sore or boil on your skin. Um, and so for that, we used uh, betonite clay, spirulina, which is a blue-green algae, and raw honey. That's it, just those three ingredients mixed together and applied as a sort of paste or a mask. The third uh, preparation that we made today uh, was an elderberry elixir. And this is an antiviral syrup that is amazing for boosting your immune system and helping to fight off viral illnesses. And the ingredients are super simple. So it's just elderberries, spices, and honey uh, to make this beautiful antiviral elixir. The fourth preparation that we made today is an allergy syrup. Uh, I myself suffer from terrible seasonal allergies and asthma, and this is the preparation that I found works the best. And again, super simple. All it is is licorice root, nettles, and raw honey. Through ethnobotany, I've also been put on this path of really valuing the knowledge of my ancestors, which um, helped me to value myself more as a native woman and as a mother. Plants really encompass the entirety of our existence. You know, they're food, of course, and they're medicine, as I said, but they're building materials, they're ceremony, they're, you know, child rearing, they're, um, you know, even, even in pregnancy, I use so many of our traditional medicines to have a healthier pregnancy uh, with my three children. So yeah, I, you know, it's, it's really, uh, plants have, have helped me so much in my life. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org.